first met Bob, we were both playing in resort hotels in approximately 1972. I had never met him, he had never met me. Uh, he was about three years younger, and he showed up with trumpet player John DeEarth. And at the house, I was living with other musicians in the mountains there. We had a little jazz situation, Cameron Brown and some other people. And so John DeEarth and Bob Mincer showed up, and they just said, oh, you can't have a drum set here. Well, and next thing, him and John Durth are playing an extremely complicated Ornette Coleman tune, very uh, disjoint motion, what do you call it? Very angular and fat, in perfect unison. Bob, you know, looked like a young Jewish guy with curly hair, and, and right away I went, whoa, you know. And I knew he was a special cat. I was doing a recording session uh, with Michael, and, and Bob was friends with Michael, and I remember the day exactly. Uh, and uh, Michael brought Bob around, introduced uh, Bob to all of us, and uh, it, was, it was simple as that, you know. And I was part of that scene, and Bob wanted a bunch of us in his band. <laughs> it was an auspicious beginning. For I was there for the very first rehearsal. It might have been as early as 82, 83. And Bob wasn't even sure if, if, the, if he would actually go through with having a big band. He had written some charts. In the first rehearsal, my impression of it was it's brilliant, exciting. The lineage from Thad Jones, which himself is lineage from Basie, uh, so there was definite connection with Thad Jones kind of writing, but with a different rhythmic impetus and other influences already visible in the first rehearsal. But that rehearsal was magic. And then we started playing uh, all around New York. We played at Michael and Randy's Club. But the 7th Avenue South, we played there a lot. I remember in that first version of the band, playing at 7th Avenue South, and there was a couple of tunes. One of them was Latin Dance. I'm not sure what what CD that was on, that were so funky that people would be screaming and standing on tables. Really, it was so funky. And at those gigs, there were people like Michael Brecker in the band, and Bob was playing. And then, the, those first recordings had people like Don Grolnick. I believe the first rehearsals had Will Lee in it. Um, Randy Brecker was in the band, lots of people. Then there came a period near the beginning where uh, Sanborn played lead alto. At some point, Bob put me on second alto with Sanborn. Sanborn did a year or so of occasional gigs and one recording, and then Sanborn left and, and Bob tried me on lead alto and kept me there from, I don't know what, 86 through the present. Until two years ago when, because he has an active band in LA, I decided I'm not in the active band, let's let Shepard play because he's doing it out there. From the beginning, going from like a kind of an updated Thad Jones, Mel Lewis, with different rhythmical feelings. That was it. Voicings and the horn fullness were related to that. Okay, it gradually evolved as Bob's uh, incredible talents and influence, where almost classical and other things, uh, for want of a better word, Dave Grusin like sounds started to come in occasionally in, in the sonorities. Um, then we went through a period where he thought everything was too loud, which is correct, and he did an album called Quiet or something, where the whole band played about one-tenth the volume of normal big band. is a new thing, I'm not even amazed, shocked at the, the stuff Bob comes up with. Thank you. 
he would let me take solos, which often baritone players don't get to do. You know, we always get stuck with the, uh, oh, we're going to add a couple of choruses, a baritone on the blues or something like that, you know. So uh, he would do that, and Bob does it. He's always aware of the people that he has in the band, and that's one of the good things about it. I've had a big band for 30 years, uh, and uh, I, I started in my career early on playing in the big bands of Buddy Rich and Thad Jones and Mel Lewis, Louis Bellison, Gil Evans, and the big band sound is still a very compelling, exciting sound, which is why I continue to work with the big band, and as a composer slash saxophonist, it's a wonderful vehicle for not only my playing, but my writing and arranging. To me, Bob Mincer is an old friend and uh, a guy who I've always looked up to because he always has this uh, sort of, in my opinion, rhythm section player's approach to writing. It always just feels good to play his tunes because he feels like he's writing them from like the basement up. Whenever I ask him for advice on something, he's usually spot on. And I think you can see that in his music. It's very thoughtful, it's complex, it's subtle, it has multi-layers to it. It's um, very, it's as if every instrument has its own perspective and he understands that and writes for the instruments in a way where they can really speak for themselves. And of course he also writes, I think, with certain players in mind. So he's, He's a thoughtful, kind person, and I think his music is thoughtful and kind. His musicianship and his career, and uh, he's, he's a constant source of inspiration to me for for my own career and my own uh, endeavors, I always think, well, well, Bob did it, I can do it too. Bob really likes all the players to be jazz players because that influences how you play his music. He lets guys blow. In the tradition of Thad Jones, he sort of lets the guys go and sets, sets up that area for guys to express themselves. And I like that about, the, about his big band charts a lot. Yeah. 